Today we're going to be looking at the scientific revolution. Uh, this will end our unit four lectures and it's really going to tie together what we've kind of started to learn about the Renaissance and the Reformation and the changes that were happening in Europe. Uh, what we are going to see is that the scientific revolution is really going to be Europe's final break from the medieval past. It's going to combine these new ideas, these new ways of thinking and questioning what people had always considered to be true. Uh, and really, a lot of the scientific part is going to deal with the physical world around us and questioning exactly how it works. Um, for th thousands of years, really, the um, Europeans had believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. Um, and this dated back to the times of Ptolemy and Socrates, you know, over a thousand years before this. And uh, what we are going to see is that that is going to come into question through scientific study. And it's first going to happen uh, with Nicholas Copernicus. Um, he's really going to change the views of astronomy. Uh, in 1543, he's going to publish uh, Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. And in this, he's going to propose a heliocentric model of our universe. Well, what does that mean? Heliocentric meaning sun-centered. Essentially, the sun is the center of our universe, not the earth. Um, most experts reject this, um, partially because of just what had been believed, and partially because uh, it really went against the church and what the church had been preaching for hundreds of years. Um, however, observations and calculations, things, the fact, uh, really support uh, the heliocentric view. Uh, these two gentlemen are going to help advance that view. Uh, Tycho Brahe and his assistant Johann Kepler are going to work to advance these ideas. Uh, for years, Brad spent uh, accumulating data about the sky, literally watching it every night, watching the way the heavenly bodies moved and documenting it. Upon his death, Kepler is going to use that data uh, to confirm that the planets orbited the sun and that the Earth was not the center of it. Which is going to lead to our next man that most of you probably heard of, Galileo. Uh, Galileo is going to assemble uh, an astronomical telescope and what he observes is going to support this theory even more. Uh, when he sees four moons moving around Jupiter, Jupiter similar to how the Earth moves around the Sun. Uh, and this is really where we are going to see an uproar happen. Uh, in 1633, the Catholic Church is going to condemn him. He is going to be tried with heresies and threatened with death unless he withdrew his claim. Uh, and so what we see is the Church actively suppressing anything that went against their teachings, uh, even something based in science and what you know many are starting to consider scientific fact at the time. Galileo's heresies, uh, he agrees to state the earth stands motionless at the center of the universe and legend has it that as he, uh, that as he uh, was leaving the court he muttered and yet it moves. Um, and so really what we see is the Catholic Church trying to you know put its foot down uh, you know really use its power that it once had and still has to kind of limit opposition or people speaking uh, about things that they don't necessarily agree with. The scientific revolution is also going to give way to new ways of advancing science. Uh, and it's the scientific method is really going to evolve from this. Uh, and really it forces people to try to move beyond simple thinking and really base their ideas in observation and experimentation. Uh, the key thing here is moving beyond simple thinking. And so what we see is with the scientific method we have these steps in which a person asks a question, does research about this question. Uh, they construct a hypothesis which are possible explanations for this question. They then test this with some sort of an experiment and then analyze the results from this. If the hypothesis, uh, hypothesis is true, they can report the results. If not, they go back, think, and try again. And this is something that is used by the men of this time and to this day in order to gain an understanding. Uh, and that's simply take 
a simple view of an issue or a problem at the time. Uh, Andreas Vesalius, uh, kind of moving in a different direction, but still um, with science, uh, is going to publish the first accurate and detailed study of the human anatomy, uh, the same year as Copernicus in 1543 when he publishes Structure of the Human Body. Um, to go along with this, Ambra Perry, uh, who was a French physician in the 1540s, is going to make advancements as well, this time uh, in infection ointment. Um, or prevention of infection ointment, uh, new surgical techniques, artificial limbs, think about that, artificial limbs some 500 years ago, and scientific instruments. Probably the most famous, or one of the most famous, was this man, Isaac Newton. Uh, in 1687, uh, Newton publishes a book explaining the laws of gather gravity and other workings of the universe. And this really kind of, you know, works with the ideas of Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo. Uh, and that using mathematics, Newton is able to show that a single force keeps the planets in their orbit, orbits around the sun. Uh, and he calls this force gravity. And so what we see is, over the course of hundreds of years, these ideas... Um, which eventually becomes steeped in fact through the use of the scientific method, take hold. Um, and like other things in the Renaissance, uh, we see it is about education. It's about using the human brain, analyzing and observing the things around you to draw a rational conclusion. It's taking the humanist ideas uh, and advancing them, um, really in order to advance society in general.